Hello. Uh, we are very lucky to have here at IE University Michael Sandel. Professor Sandel is the Auntie and Robert M. Bass Professor of uh, Government at the University of uh, Harvard and where he teaches political philosophy. Um, his works has been now translated into more than 27 different languages. Um, his course, Justice, is released for free on different uh, social networks and, and has been attended by tens of millions of, uh, of different uh, citizens across the world. He was, among other things, recognized as the most influential uh, figure in China in 2011. He also received the Princesa de Asturias Award in uh, 2018. And his books, of course, are well known by not just uh, scholars, but by many other people. Let me just uh, mention some of them. The latest one was The Tyranny of Merit. Um, and some others include uh, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets, Justice, What is uh, the Right Thing to Do, Public Philosophy, or liberalism and the limits of justice, among others. No? So thanks very much, Professor, for, for being here with us. Uh, I know we are squeezing you today because you have a session with our students afterwards, and you have already attended some other sessions with journalists. But let me start by uh, going back to when you were 18 years old and you were attending your high school in Palisades. Right, right. When you decided to challenge the then governor of California, Ronald Reagan, uh, you made a number of questions. You formulated a number of questions, very challenging questions. Yes. You were very confident you were going to win the audience. <laughs> but it seems that uh, the, the final result uh, went the other way around. Uh? Well, yes and no. It is true. <laughs> Uh, when I was 18 uh, in my high school in California, um, I proposed a debate with Ronald Reagan, who was then the governor of California and uh, likely future candidate for president. And uh, I was a debater. So I thought my debating skills would uh, enable me very easily to um, win a debate with Ronald Reagan. Uh, I invited him to, to our surprise, he agreed to come. Mm. We had 2,400 students gather in the auditorium. And uh, I, as you said, I had prepared these challenging questions. He was for the Vietnam War. We were all against it. He mm. was critical of social security. We were in favor of it. He was against giving 18-year-olds the right to vote, which was an issue then. And most of you were actually 18 years old. So. Yes, so of course we were in favor of that. And so I challenged him on these and other questions. Um, and what was surprising was he listened very respectfully, replied with great charm. And though he didn't persuade us, of his views. At the end of the hour, oh, and then after I tried, we let the students put questions to him. Same thing. He didn't persuade us. But at the end of the hour, I thanked him. He left. Everyone applauded. And I can't say that I won the debate because he somehow deflected the questions and charmed the audience with his sincerity and his humor but above all, the respect he accorded us. And this, this taught me an important lesson about politics, that it isn't debating skills or debating points that prevail. It's the way one connects with and shows respect for the audience. And this skill enabled him uh, some years Indeed. later to be elected president of the United States. That, that, that's very interesting since uh, debating is a very common practice at uh, many universities, yeah. including ours. And uh, at Oxford, where you actually also studied, you were a Rhodes Scholar, uh, the union uh, yes. there and the debating society has been the cradle of, among others, some of the politicians yes. that, uh, that led also uh, the UK into Brexit. No? I, and I wonder, but as you say, uh, respect in debate is something which is essential also yes. for democratic debate. Yes. Right? 
Yes, it is. And it goes beyond winning an argument. It has to do with the spirit in which we enter into political debate. And part of what makes politics today so frustrating for many citizens, maybe most citizens, is that people don't feel that their voice matters. People feel that what passes for political discourse consists of shouting matches, where people shout past one another without really listening. Mm. And I think there's a hunger for a better kind of public discourse. But in the meantime, we have the anger and frustration building because politics seems to be about small things. Mm. And criticizing others, no? Yeah. So it's rather the, the argument against the person than, yes. than against the ideas, no? Yes, yes. I was wondering, you're able to attract uh, big audiences. You're a very popular philosopher. And, uh, and I recall that uh, it is said that the first uh, traffic jam uh, in, on, on Fifth Avenue in New York was caused by a philosopher. It was Henri Bergson hmm. in the early 19th century. Hmm. He wrote on, on humor and some other yeah. things. But supposedly he, he was a philosopher very um, entertaining. And, uh, and you are also a, a person that gathers these large audiences talking about philosophy, which is not something very intuitive. So how do you engage with uh, your audience and, and with participants? How do you make philosophy that su such an attractive su subject in, 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 that, in those large audiences? Right. Well, part of it is my conception of what philosophy is and what it's for. When people hear philosophy, they often think of abstractions and demanding texts. And the great philosophical writings of the tradition are very demanding. But people feel that philo they think of philosophy as residing in the heavens, hmm. far beyond the world in which we live. Philosophy is a vocation for dreamers, many people often think that has little to do with the lives we actually live. I don't see philosophy that way. I, I think philosophy uh, should not reside in the clouds, but in the city where citizens gather and disagree and debate one another and ideally reason together about big questions that matter. And so to address your question, when I, um, speak and uh, address audiences in various places. Uh, I try to connect philosophy with questions people already care about even before they realize that philosophical issues are at stake. Uh, questions about what counts as a just society. Uh, what should be the role of money in markets? Mm. Oh, what do we owe one another as fellow citizens? These are questions of moral and political philosophy, but they, they bear directly on the debates we have every day about how to get along with one another, about what we owe one another, about what the tax rate should be, about what the laws should be. So relating philosophy, whether in the classroom or in public settings, to questions people already care about is part of what engages people, I think. And I let them talk back and argue back with the philosophers, with me, with one another. Because philosophy, at its best, I think, is about dialogue, reasoning together, not just sitting in a study and reading a book or writing a, a treatise. And so that's why, whenever possible, I, I put questions to the audience, especially if it's a group of students who have a passion, I find. Anywhere, everywhere I go, a passion to argue together, reason together in public with their peers and with me hmm. about big questions that matter to them. That really is, I think, um, what attracts people to philosophy and to these discussions. I guess for, for those who haven't seen your uh, recorded sessions, 
uh, it has to be clarified that you don't... Pro philosophy is not about uh, providing ready-made solutions right. or telling what is right or wrong. No? Yeah. But rather, uh, what you do is actually um, nurturing that dialogue yeah. and asking people to think by themselves. Yes. Uh, asking the right questions, actually, right? Yes, and to encourage people, to invite people to articulate the reasons lying behind their opinions and moral convictions. And then to listen to others do the same, and where they disagree, to try to figure out why. And that leads to a discussion, sometimes very lively and vigorous, stimulating discussions. But these are not discussions where people are shouting past one another. It's where people are thinking together, trying to figure out what they believe and why. Hmm. I was wondering, you, you, you have also discussed a, a number of times on the impact of technology across many different fields. And yeah. uh, we are all aware now about uh, the new devices, artificial intelligence devices, their impact in the way we uh, know the world, the way we access knowledge. I'm sure you, you may have seen some uh, examples, ChatGPT and others. Right. And I was wondering how you see the impact of all these uh, devices in the world of education, how we can preserve critical thinking and some other basic skills in our students while at the same time benefit from all the contribution of this uh, new technology. Right. Uh, well, one of the first worries raised about ChatGPT was would it enable students to submit essays or papers written in whole or in part by a bot rather than by themselves. Mm. And in the short term, I think many professors hope and assume, well, I can tell what's written by a student and what's written by a chat bot. But it's becoming increasingly difficult. What this suggests, though, is something is at stake that's bigger than figuring out or preventing cheating with the, this device. If an AI device can replicate something that looks pretty similar to an essay or an exam that we would assign students, Maybe that suggests that we need to think more creatively about the assignments. Hmm. Because if we really want to promote critical thinking and self-examination, maybe we have to find more creative ways than the kind of formulaic, that then would lend themselves to the formulaic kind of algorithmic uh, composed uh, response that mm. uh, ChatGPT can provide. Mm. Indeed. Um, this year we are celebrating the centenary of uh, John Rawls, and uh, oh, yeah. you had the chance of uh, working with him, and uh, you also reviewed his work. You were one of the most uh, influential thinkers in, in revising no? his uh, main thesis. What do you think is the major contribution of John Rawls uh, these days, no? given that uh, his books are still very influential, but mostly, I would say, in academia, no? rather than uh, in, in the general public. Well, John Rawls was um, arguably uh, the greatest or one of the greatest political philosophers of the 20th century, uh, certainly of the period um, after the Second World War. And his great book, A Theory of Justice, is a classic. And it makes an argument. It was published in the early 1970s. It provides the, the most powerful philosophical argument for the welfare state that had emerged uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War. And for a more generous welfare state than the United States, certainly at that time and maybe since, has achieved. And he also made a strong case for respect for individual rights. 
And so I think these are great achievements, and it's a very influential book that rightly is seen as a classic. You're right when you say that I wrote critically of John Rawls's argument. My first book, Liberalism and the Limits of Justice, was a critique of John Rawls's version of liberalism, and that emerged from the dissertation I wrote. Uh, mm -hmm. as a graduate student at Oxford. And I certainly agreed with his argument about the importance of individual rights. Where I disagreed was in his claim, which is a, a very serious and important claim in political philosophy, that because we live in pluralist societies, because we disagree among ourselves about moral and religious questions about conceptions of the good, we should try to think of justice and rights as a framework that is neutral toward our competing conceptions of the good life and of virtue. I understand why there, there's something very attractive in that project, because it seems a way to at least secure respect for fundamental rights and toleration in the face of our moral disagreements. But I argued then, and I continue to think, that the aspiration for principles of justice that are neutral with respect to competing virtues and conceptions of how to live, I, I don't think that project can succeed. That was part of my argument. The second part of my argument was the attempt to present conceptions of justice as if they are truly neutral. The attempt to defend laws and rights of this kind or that kind, claiming that I'm not taking a stand one way or the other on your religious convictions or her moral convictions. I think that creates a kind of hollow public discourse. It invites citizens to leave their moral and spiritual convictions outside when they enter the public square. And that creates a public square that is so empty of moral argument mm. that it, um, it's unsatisfying. Uh, no policy or law really is neutral on moral and, and uh, questions and conceptions of the good. Mm. So there is a kind of, uh, people sense there's a bad faith in the insistence that we're deciding whether or not, what the law should be, for example, on abortion or on same-sex marriage. But we're not taking sides on your, on your moral convictions about those subjects. Um, I think that leads to a kind of thin toleration that people hmm. don't ultimately believe in. So I'm for a more robust pluralism, one that welcomes into the public square even hotly contested hmm. moral and even spiritual convictions so that people can reason and argue, sometimes with passion, about those questions, learn to listen and to learn from one another. Even if it doesn't yield agreement, I think we learn something and we have a healthier public life. So that's what's at issue. But none of that diminishes my respect and admiration for John Rawls as a philosopher and for framing this question with a clarity that I think uh, arguably we haven't seen you know, for, for a century or more. Hmm. But very interesting, your description. And, and probably history has um, given you um, the, 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 actually the support for, for, for your ideas, no? given that most um, moral and uh, basic legal options are actually you know, linked to questions of principle, no? Those... Well, I think, I think they are linked to questions of, of principle. And the issue, Rawls would not deny that exactly, but he would say the principle should be independent of independent conceptions of the of good life. Yeah. And I don't think that's possible. If history has suggested any verdict in this debate, and the history never issues unambiguous verdicts. 
there is one uh, that favors my position, which is I worry um, that trying to make public discourse neutral toward moral questions people care about is not only impossible, but it's undesirable because it creates a moral void hmm. that sooner or later will be filled Indeed. by narrow, intolerant moralisms, typically hypernationalism hmm. or religious fundamentalism. These are the forces that enter the public space if that public space is left empty. That's very interesting. A robust moral argument. And we've seen this Indeed. happening. Uh, in ways that have actually cast a, a dark shadow over the future of democracy. And I think that has partly to do with the mistaken attempt to uh, claim that public life could be neutral toward moral questions. It's also closely connected to our tendency over recent decades to rely more and more on markets to mm. decide contested public questions. Mm. Part of the appeal, the deep appeal of markets and the market faith that had such sway over the past four decades, I think, mm. is not just the, the belief that markets deliver the goods and prosperity. I mean, that's important. But markets seem to be a morally neutral way of deciding hard public questions yeah, and yeah. to spare us as democratic citizens the need to engage in messy, contentious debates. And so the reach for neutral, the aspiration for a neutral public sphere with regard to justice and rights makes us readier to say we'll outsource our moral judgments to markets. And I think that's been a mistake. Hmm. Allow me a final question uh, related to one of your proposals in the tyranny of uh, merit. Yes. Where you analyze uh, with uh, lots of information, you provide lot, lots of references, both on, on the professional uh, world as well as uh, in the academic world, right. no? about how meritocracy works and what are the pros and cons yeah. of the system. No? And, uh, in the end, you propose to use uh, different mechanisms in order to distribute uh, um, the merits no? or the places at uh, Ivy League institutions, no? like, for example, right. running a lottery among those who potentially have uh, the profile to enter right. the universities. But I wonder whether, do you think, what is the reaction of, <laughs> of your students when you <laughs> propose these sorts of radical solutions? Well, my students, many of them are skeptical of my, my critique of meritocracy, understandably, because they've worked hard for years and years from the time they were very young to score well on tests and get good grades and do extracurricular activities and um, in the belief, encouraged by their parents, that their success in university admissions and maybe also in life, depends on them, on their efforts, on how hard they work. Mm. Now, this message is right at the heart of the meritocratic ideal. Our success is our own doing, at least insofar as chances are equal. Now, we know chances are not equal. We don't live up to the meritocratic ideals we profess. But somewhere underlying this ideal is the idea that if only we could make opportunities equal, bring everyone to the same starting point in the race, then the winners would deserve their winnings. That's the teaching. And students absorb this, especially those who have been yeah. pressured by their parents and their teachers all along the way to believe their hard work will determine their fate. But there's a dark side to this. Part of the dark side is the tremendous pressure that's brought to bear on these young people so that they are kind of driven to a kind of perfectionism and they feel that any time they fall short, it's a, a judgment on them. It's their failure. But there's another dark side to, this, uh, to the meritocratic ideal, and that is it leads 
the successful to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and by implication that those who struggle, who are left behind, have no one to blame but themselves. Hmm. And so they too must deserve their fate. This is a very ungenerous ethic for a democratic society. That's my main uh, critique <laughs> of meritocracy. But as for the lottery, this is to try to, the idea is the university should determine who's qualified to do the work and, who, and to do it well and to benefit from the education and to contribute. And that might be far more people than there are places. So I suggest that from that group, the university admit on the basis of lottery, a lottery of the qualified, I call it. Mm -hmm. And my main reason for this is to question and to invite, to invite the students to question the hubris, hmm. the conviction, uh, the, the meritocratic hubris that leads us too easily to forget the luck and good fortune that help us on our way, that leads Indeed. us to forget our indebtedness to those who make our achievements possible. So this is the moral point lying behind my proposal of a lottery. No, which is a very, very provocative one. What I wonder is how we can balance no? uh, yeah. that moral luck yeah. that happens uh, and that promotes, um, that, that balances actually the, the equality of opportunities that you were describing, how we can balance that with, with for example, lifelong learning right. or options throughout, you know, uh, many different uh, opportunities in yes. life, just uh, not just, you know, at, at once yes. no? when, when yeah. they enter university. No? That's it's very important. Mm. I think the, well, there are two great incentives to lifelong learning. One is to the, uh, the utilitarian one, mm -hmm. that it helps you prepare for changes in the job market that occur at a time when people can't simply prepare for one career, but have to be prepared to educate themselves for new opportunities and challenges in the economy. That's the utilitarian mm. case for lifelong learning. But there's also a more intrinsic case, which is ideally learning should become a habit that people value and prize and love for its own sake, for the intrinsic satisfaction that comes from learning. And there's no reason that that intrinsic satisfaction should end after undergraduate years or after a professional degree. Indeed. If, if, uh, and this goes to the questions of the good life. Hmm. I, I think one important ingredient of a good life is the curiosity and openness of mind and spirit that uh, prompts a continuing desire to learn and to grow as part of one's self-development. So here we have a very clear contrast between the utilitarian rationale Indeed. that we were discussing earlier and the, the intrinsic love of learning that universities at their mm -hmm. best should have as their primary purpose to cultivate. Indeed, that we should instill yeah. in our students. Professor Sandel, it has been uh, such an enjoyable yeah. interview and conversation. I've, I now realize, you know, why you gather so many participants in, in, in your classes. Thanks very much for being here at IE University. And uh, of course, what I hope is that you feel at home afterwards with our students. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.